Hey there, I'm Emma Clark. Born and raised in the small town of Harlow, nothing fancy, just a place where faces are familiar and secrets don't stay hidden for long. I made my way through college, diving straight into the world of retail after graduation. Lingerie wasn't just a product to me, it was a passion. I worked my tail off and eventually, I was the proud owner of a chain of lingerie stores that spanned from cozy little boutiques to swanky outlets. Work was my life, and I was good at it, damn good. But you know how it goes, after stacking up those hours, days, and months into a neat pile of success, I started feeling like there was something missing. That's when Michael came into the picture. It was just a ping on my phone at first, a friend request from a guy with a sharp suit and sharper eyes, judging from his profile picture. I didn't know him, but a quick peek through his profile showed a man who seemed to have it all together, a lawyer, which explained the fancy suit. Curiosity got the better of me, and I hit accept. It wasn't long before his first message popped up one evening while I was balancing my accounts. Michael. Hey Emma, thanks for accepting my request. Noticed we have a few friends in common. How's it going? Simple enough, right? But it was his follow-up messages that really got me. He was witty and had a way of making me laugh, even after a long day. I remember one night, we were chatting about something stupid, like the worst pickup lines we'd ever heard, and his humor just clicked with me. Michael. Ever had this one? Are you a magician? Because whenever I look at you, everyone else disappears. Bet you heard that one in your line of work. Emma, oh, for sure, top of the cringe chart. My comeback? Are you a photographer? Because I really want to lead this shoot. He laughed, or at least, he typed out a laugh. Hard to tell, but it felt genuine. After a few weeks of chatting, he suggested meeting up in person. Just a casual coffee, to put a real face to the text, he said. It sounded good to me. The first time we met, it was at this little dive that I loved, because they didn't skimp on the caffeine. He was already there when I walked in, scanning a newspaper. He looked up, and that sharp-eyed, professional profile picture did him no justice, he was better in the flesh. Emma? Wow, you actually look like your pictures. That's a rarity in this city. Well, thanks. I think? You're not so bad yourself, despite the lawyer vibe. He laughed, and that icebreaker just melted away any awkwardness. We talked for hours. It wasn't just fluff, either. Michael had depth. He asked about my business, my dreams, and listened, really listened, to what I had to say. The thing about Michael is, he never did anything by halves. When we'd been seeing each other for a year, he decided it was time to take things to the next level. I was closing up shop one chilly evening when he showed up unannounced, his breath misting in the cold air as he held out a small, velvet box. Emma, I've been thinking, he started, and boy, did he look nervous. We've been doing great, you and me. I think it's time we thought about making this a permanent deal. I froze, the keys to the store still in my hand. Michael, are you saying what I think you're saying? He cracked a smile, that charming, lopsided grin that always made my heart skip. Yeah, I am. Marry me, Emma. Let's not play around anymore. I want you as my partner, for good. My heart was racing, my mind spinning with a thousand thoughts. Marriage? Was I ready? But looking into his eyes, seeing the earnestness there, it felt right. Yes, I breathed out. Yes, I'll marry you. But then he shifted, his expression turning serious again. There's something else, though. We need to talk about some legal stuff. Prenup stuff. The word prenup hit me like a bucket of ice water. Prenup? Really, Michael? Is that necessary? He hurried to explain, holding my hands in his to stop them from trembling. Listen, it's not that I don't trust you, Emma. It's just practical, especially with me being a lawyer. I've seen too many messy splits, not to be cautious. Plus, it's going to protect both of us. What kind of protection are we talking about here? I asked, my voice a mix of curiosity and concern. Michael pulled out some papers from his briefcase. 
it's straightforward. If either of us cheats, the cheater loses their assets to the other. Simple and fair. You know I wouldn't cheat on you, Emma. This is just a safety net. I took a deep breath, trying to process it all. The romantic proposal now tangled up with talk of cheating and assets, it wasn't how I pictured my engagement. But then, life with Michael wasn't ordinary, and maybe this was just another part of that. I looked down at the papers, then back at his face, reading the sincerity there. All right, I'll think about it. But let me be clear, Michael, I'm not planning to ever give you a reason to use this against me. That's all I'm asking for, he replied, relief washing over his face. We went out to celebrate that night, and despite the weird mix of emotions, the evening was perfect. The restaurant was cozy, the food delicious, and Michael was attentive, making me laugh and forget about the legalities for a few hours. Later, as we walked back to the car under the stars, Michael stopped and pulled me close. You know I love you, right? No piece of paper's gonna change that. I nodded, resting my head against his chest. I know, Michael. I love you too. Just, let's make sure this prenup thing doesn't mess us up, okay? He kissed the top of my head. It won't. Promise. And that was it. I signed the prenup a few days later, after reading it over with my own lawyer, just to be sure. It felt weird, signing a document that talked about the end of a marriage when ours hadn't even begun. But love's a gamble, and I was all in. I just hoped my bet on Michael was the right one. We were the couple everyone envied, always laughing and whispering to each other at parties. But a few months in, things started to change. It wasn't something I could put my finger on right away, just a chill that settled over us slowly. The real trouble started a few weeks later. We were out shopping, and I was looking for some new scents in a perfume shop. I chatted with the sales guy, just casual talk about fragrances. When we left the store, Michael was fuming. Who was that, he barked as soon as we were clear of the crowded mall. I was taken aback. The sales guy? I was just asking him about the perfumes. Why? Seemed like you were really into him, Michael shot back, his eyes hard. Are you serious right now? I stopped walking, staring at him in disbelief. I was talking about perfumes, Michael. What's gotten into you? He scoffed, shaking his head as he started walking again. Nothing. Forget it. Let's just go home. But it didn't stop there. It got worse. Anytime I talked to a man, Michael would sulk or make snide comments. He became colder at home, too, retreating behind his laptop or phone, leaving me to eat dinner alone most nights. One evening, I decided to confront him. I couldn't stand the icy atmosphere anymore. I found him in his study, staring blankly at a spreadsheet. Michael, we need to talk, I said, standing in the doorway. He didn't look up. About? About us. About how you've been acting lately, I walked over and closed the laptop in front of him. You've been distant, and any time I interact with another guy, you act like I've committed some crime. He rubbed his temples, sighing heavily. Emma, you don't understand the pressure I'm under at work. And when I see you, laughing and chatting with other men, it just, it gets to me, okay? And sometimes, I feel like you don't respect our relationship enough to keep your distance. We stared at each other, the air thick with unsaid things, and the echo of our raised voices. But then, something new stirred the pot, rumors from friends started trickling in saying Michael had been telling people I was a flirt, chatting up other men whenever he turned his back. I couldn't believe it. You've been talking about me behind my back? Telling people I flirt with other guys? Look, Emma, it's not like that. I might have said something here or there, but it's only because I see how they look at you, how you... Stop. I cut him off, my anger peaking. I don't believe this. You have no right to spread lies about me. You're supposed to be my partner, Michael, not my biggest critic. After that last big fight, things between Michael and me cooled off a bit. One morning, I found a note from Michael on the kitchen counter. His handwriting, usually so precise, looked rushed this time. 
I picked it up, my heart pounding a little harder than usual. Emma, let's try to start over. Meet me at the Grandview Hotel, room 204, at 8 p.m. tonight. Let's put the past behind us and move forward. M. I stared at the note for a long minute. This was unexpected. Maybe this was his way of reaching out, trying to mend things. I decided to go, hope fluttering in my chest like a fragile bird. The day dragged by. Work was a blur. I couldn't focus on the customer orders or the inventory. My mind kept drifting back to the note, to what the evening might bring. Could we really start over? By the time I shut the shop and headed to the hotel, I was a bundle of nerves. When I arrived at the Grand View, my palms were sweaty. I checked my reflection in the car mirror, fixed my hair, dabbed on a bit of lipstick. Not too much. I didn't want to look like I was trying too hard. Room 204 was on the second floor. The hallway was quiet, just the soft hum of the air conditioning. I knocked. No answer. I knocked again, then, with a hesitant hand, turned the doorknob. It was open. The room was dimly lit by a bedside lamp, casting long shadows across the bed. There was an open bottle of wine on the table, two glasses beside it, and a small plate of fruit slices. But no Michael. Michael? I called out, stepping inside, letting the door click shut behind me. Are you here? Silence. Just the soft whir of the air conditioner. I thought about leaving, but then I decided to wait. I poured myself a glass of wine, the red liquid swirling in the glass. Just one glass, I muttered to myself, to calm the nerves. I took a sip, the wine rich and a little too sweet. I sat down on the edge of the bed, my mind racing. The wine was starting to make my head a bit fuzzy, or was it my nerves? I lay back, just to rest my eyes for a moment. The room spun gently, and then everything went black. When I woke up, it was dark outside. I tried to sit up, but my head was pounding, and my thoughts were foggy. My phone was on the nightstand, I grabbed it, the light from the screen blindingly bright in the dim room. I checked the time. It was past midnight. Panic clawed at my chest. I tried to remember what happened, how I ended up lying here, but it was like grasping at smoke. I realized with a start that I was not dressed, lying there without my clothes. I called Michael, my fingers trembling as I dialed his number. The phone rang, then, his voice, cold and distant. Emma? What's up? Michael, where are you? Why didn't you come to the hotel? I asked, my voice shaking. Hotel? What are you talking about, Emma? Are you drunk? Have you lost your mind? I'm at the Grand View, like you told me. Why did you ask me to come here if you weren't going to show up? My voice rose in anger and confusion. Emma, I don't know what sick game you're playing, but I didn't write any note. I've been home all night. You're out of control, running around with your lovers. I even thought about calling the police. Driving home from that disastrous night at the hotel, my mind was in turmoil. Michael's cold, dismissive voice on the phone replayed over and over in my head. What was happening? It felt like I was being sucked into a nightmare I couldn't wake up from. As I pulled into the driveway, the familiar sight of our home brought no comfort, only a knot of dread in my stomach. I stepped inside, and the tension hit me like a wave. Michael was pacing the living room, his face twisted in anger. As soon as he saw me, he exploded. There you are. The wandering wife returns. He yelled, his voice dripping with scorn. Michael, please, we need to talk. Something very wrong happened tonight. I pleaded, my voice shaky but desperate to make him understand. But he wasn't listening. Instead, he slammed a stack of photos on the table. Explain these then, he shouted. I picked up the photos, my hands trembling. They showed me in a hotel room, in bed with a man I had never seen before. My heart sank. Michael, I don't know who this is. I swear, I've never seen this man before. Something happened to me tonight, something I can't explain. 
He laughed, a harsh, mocking sound that sent shivers down my spine. A monstrous mistake? Or just your monstrous behavior? Marrying you was the real mistake. I felt tears prick my eyes, but I fought them back, needing to stay strong, to stay clear-headed. I didn't do this, Michael. You have to believe me. But he wasn't done. Believe you? Why should I? You're a liar and a cheat. And I'll make sure you don't get a cent from me. I'm going to court, and I will take everything from you, as per our agreement. He spat out before grabbing his suitcase, already packed, and heading for the door. With a final glare, he slammed the door behind him, leaving me alone in the echoing silence of the house. I collapsed on the couch, my body shaking. The pain in my head was relentless, throbbing with an intensity that made it hard to think. But it was more than just a headache, it felt like my brain was foggy, my memories of the night blurred and inconsistent. That's when it hit me, the wine. I had only one glass, but the dizziness and the blackout didn't make sense. It was too extreme, too sudden. I grabbed my phone and dialed my friend Lisa, a nurse, hoping she could shed some light on my symptoms. Lisa, something's not right. I had a glass of wine, and then everything went black. I woke up hours later, and now Michael has these photos. It doesn't add up, I explained hurriedly, my words tumbling out. There was a pause on the other end as Lisa digested my words. Emma, it sounds like you might have been drugged. You need to get to a hospital or a lab and get tested right now. Tell them what happened, especially about the wine and your symptoms. The drive to the lab was a blur, my thoughts racing as I tried to piece everything together. At the lab, I explained the situation to the technician, who nodded solemnly and took several vials of blood. A couple of days after my visit to the hotel, a letter arrived with a heavy thud on my doorstep. It was from Michael. My hands shook as I tore it open, my worst fears confirmed in the cold, formal language of the legal notice. Michael was suing me for infidelity, aiming to strip me of everything I owned based on our prenuptial agreement. The trial was set for a month from now. I called my lawyer, Paul, immediately. His voice was a small comfort amid the chaos. Emma, come to my office. We need to strategize. I drove to Paul's office, my mind racing with every possible scenario, except the one where I came out unscathed. As I pulled into the parking lot, my eyes caught a familiar figure, Michael, walking alongside a young man, the same one from the photos he had used to frame me. Without thinking, I reached for my phone and started recording. I caught them exchanging an envelope, the young man tucking it quickly into his jacket. My heart pounded as I realized the significance of what I might have just captured. At Paul's office, I showed him the video. His eyebrows shot up as he watched the exchange. This is good, Emma. It's very suspicious. I think it's time we brought in a private investigator. Paul's friend, a seasoned private investigator named Jack, took the case. He moved quickly, tailing the young actor and digging into his background. A few days later, Jack called us into the office with news. I've spoken to the kid, Jack started, his expression serious. He's a bit of an actor, down on his luck. Said your husband hired him to play a part. The part? Your lover. He also confessed that your husband planned everything, even the drugged wine. As we were talking, my phone pinged with an email, my blood test results. I opened the attachment, my breath catching as I read the findings. Positive for a potent sedative, just as Jack had said. I passed my phone to Paul, who read the results and looked up, his eyes hardening with resolve. This is it, Emma. This is what we need. With this evidence, we can not only defend you, but also turn the tables on Michael. Paul advised keeping everything under wraps until the court date. Let's not tip him off. We'll hit him with this in court, give him the surprise of his life. A week had passed since the hotel debacle, and I was back in the familiar confines of my lingerie store, trying to keep my mind off the upcoming court date. It was a regular afternoon until Michael walked in, a woman on his arm. Emma, meet Lila, my bride-to-be, he announced with a pride that didn't quite reach his eyes. 
Lila looked young, too young perhaps to understand the type of man she was dealing with. She glanced at me with a mixture of curiosity and judgment. Michael wasted no time stirring up trouble. Take a good look around, Emma. Soon enough, all this will be mine. His arm swept across the expanse of my store with theatrical grandeur, a smirk playing on his lips. Lila's eyes followed his gesture, her look hardening with more conviction. I wanted to reach out, to warn her, but I remembered Paul's strict instructions to keep quiet until the hearing. All I could do was smile thinly and respond with as much dignity as I could muster. We'll see what the judge has to say about that, Michael. The day of the court session arrived all too quickly. The courtroom was austere, the air thick with anticipation. Michael, ever the lawyer, chose to represent himself. He stood, adjusting his tie, a clear show of self-assurance as he prepared to deliver his opening statement. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael began, his voice steady and clear. Today you will see the true colors of a woman who not only broke the vows of marriage but sought to destroy the sanctity of our home with her deceit. As you will see from these photos, he continued, gesturing to the evidence displayed on the screen behind him. My wife, Emma, was not the faithful partner she promised to be. The photos from the hotel room flashed up, eliciting murmurs from the courtroom. For months, I lived in torment, suspecting her infidelities. And finally, as these pictures show, my worst fears were confirmed. He paused, letting the weight of his words sink. He walked closer to where I sat, his eyes locked on mine. Emma here would have you believe she's a victim, an innocent caught in circumstances beyond her control. His tone was scathing, his words rehearsed, but effective. But I tell you, she is not a victim. She is a perpetrator, a destroyer of our union. As he spoke, I could see the calculated pauses, the measured glances at the judge, the way he laid out each sentence with the precision of a seasoned attorney. The evidence is clear, undeniable. Emma's actions have caused irreparable damage, not just to our marriage but to the very fabric of trust that binds any relationship. Michael concluded, his speech crescendoing in a dramatic plea for justice. My lawyer, Paul, had a calm demeanor as he rose to address the court, his briefcase full of the evidence that would clear my name. Your Honor, Paul began, his voice steady and commanding. Today, we not only defend Emma Clark's honor, but also reveal a pattern of deceit perpetrated by her husband, Michael Clark. He motioned to the back of the courtroom, and the actor who Michael had hired walked in, his presence causing a stir among the spectators. Paul asked him to share his involvement, and the young man looked nervously around before speaking. I was hired to act a part, I thought it was just a prank, he admitted, his voice shaky. I didn't realize the seriousness of what was being orchestrated. Paul nodded gravely, then presented the blood test results to the court. These results show that Emma was incapacitated against her will, drugged by substances she had no knowledge of consuming. The courtroom murmured as the implications sank in. Furthermore, Paul continued, his tone hardening, this is not the first time Mr. Clark has employed such tactics. He laid out evidence of Michael's previous marriages, detailing how similar patterns had led to his unjust enrichment at the expense of his former wives. As Paul concluded his arguments, the weight of the evidence was palpable. We ask not only for the dismissal of the fraudulent claims made against Emma, but also for just compensation for the ordeal she has endured. The judge nodded, taking in everything before delivering her verdict. After careful consideration of the evidence presented, I find in favor of Emma Clark. The prenuptial agreement is hereby annulled. Relief washed over me, tears pricking my eyes, not just from the victory but from the vindication. Furthermore, the judge added, the court awards Mrs. Clark damages in the amount of $400,000. Michael's face was ashen, his future crumbled before him. His fiance, present in the courtroom, hurried out, only to return briefly to whisper a thank you to me for exposing the truth before leaving him for good. The news of the trial spread like wildfire, the details sensational enough to hit the headlines. Michael's professional reputation was irrevocably damaged, he was stripped of his license to practice law. 
The revelation prompted his ex-wives to file lawsuits against him, uncovering a trail of deceit that left him financially and socially bankrupt. As I closed up shop one evening, the glow of the sunset casting long shadows on the floor, I reflected on the journey. The battle had been hard fought, marked by moments of despair and indignity, but ultimately, it was a testament to resilience and justice.